What a wonderful group of people. Oh my goodness, the energy here tonight is just, whew. Ah. I wanted to talk tonight about the power of our spoken word. The power of our spoken word. What does that mean? What does that mean? Are you aware of how very important your words are? How important your thoughts are and how important your words are? Very important. Now words, 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 we use them all the time and we babble away seldom thinking of anything. We don't even know what we're saying half the time or how we're saying things. And we pay little attention to the selection of our words. You know, as children we were taught grammar. We were to taught to select words according to their rules of grammar. However, I always found that the rules of grammar continuously changed. And what was uh, improper at one time is pro proper at another time or vice versa. And sometimes what is slang at one time becomes common usage later on. But what grammar does not take into consideration is the meaning of the word and how it affects our lives. How do the words affect our lives? See, I was never taught at school that my choice of words would have anything to do with what I would experience in life. See, nobody taught me that my thoughts were creative, that my thoughts could literally shape my life. Nobody taught me that what I gave out would return to me. Whatever I was giving to other people, see the golden rule, remember, was never meant to cause guilt. It was to show us a very basic law of life. What you give out comes back to you. Nobody ever taught me that I was worth loving. Nobody ever taught me that I deserved good. And nobody taught me that life was here to support me. Now, as a child, I remember we would often call each other cruel and hurtful names and try to belittle each other. But why wouldn't we? Look at where we learned them. Look where we learned such behavior. Many of us were told repeatedly by our parents that we were stupid and dumb and ugly, a nuisance, not good enough. Sometimes we were told they wished that we had never been born etc. And we cringed when we heard these words, but we didn't realize how deep-seated that pain would become. Nor did we realize that we were good children and being good children, we too would pick up the same habit of calling ourselves the same things and treating ourselves in the same way. Too often we have accepted early messages of don't exist don't exist, or conditional don't exist. Sometimes like, you know, eat your spinach, clean your room, or make your bed, and then we'll love you. And you get the idea that you're acceptable if you do certain things. But that acceptance is always according to something else, and it has nothing to do with deep inner self-worth. You get the idea that you can exist only if you do these things, and you don't have permission to exist otherwise. These early messages contribute to what I call self-talk, the way we talk to ourselves. And the way we talk to ourselves is really important because it becomes the basis of our spoken word. It sets up the mental atmosphere that we operate in and that attracts to us experiences. If we belittle ourselves, life is going to mean very little to us. And if we love and appreciate ourselves, then life can be a wonderful, wonderful present. It's really up to us. If our life is unhappy or we're unfulfilled, it's very easy to just blame our parents or them, the famous them, and say it's all their fault. But if we do that, we stay stuck in our problems. These words will not bring us freedom. If we do that, how are we going to find our power? Remember, our power is in our words. Our power comes from taking responsibility for our lives. I know it sounds scary to be responsible for our lives, but you know we really are, whether we accept that or not, because the thoughts we think and the words we speak are constantly creating our future. 
Our beliefs shape our life. So we need to take responsibility for our lives in the here and now. And if you really want to be responsible for your life, then you've got to be responsible for your mouth. The things we say are extensions of our thoughts. Now, what is the first thing that you say to yourself in the morning when you wake up? And the second thing, and the third thing. Most people say more or less the same thing all the time in the morning. How does that start your day? Is that a positive way to start your day? Or is it grumbling and complaining? Because if you grumble and complain and moan, then that's the sort of day you're going to have. You're setting yourself up for it. What's the last thought you think at night before you go to bed? So you're shaping your future. And are they power thoughts? Or are they poverty thoughts? Remember, poverty is not just the lack of money. It can be the lack of anything in your life, any part of your life that is not flowing freely. So your normal way of thinking, are you really into poverty thoughts or are you into power thoughts? I remember when I first heard that I could change my life if I was willing to change my thinking. And that was quite a revolutionary idea. This was in New York City when I first discovered the Church of Religious Science, Science of Mind. They were the very first people that told me that. And even though I didn't understand what they meant, it sort of rang a bell. It, it touched what I call the inner ding if, within me. <laughs> you know that place of intuition? I've learned to follow that because when that ding goes yes, even if it sounds very crazy, I know that it's right for me. So this idea was right for me. It struck a chord in me. Something said, yes, they're right. And then I began the adventure of learning how to change my thinking. You know, you get the idea and you say yes, and then you get to go through the hows. Well, I read a lot of books, I took a lot of classes, and I explored everything I could. And I really delved into science of mind at the time because that was an avenue that was open for me and I found it really wonderful. And at first it was sort of easy, you know, and I grasped a few concepts and I started to think and talk a little bit differently. And I no longer was complaining quite so much. I was a great complainer and I was great into self-pity in those days. That was one of my things that I just loved. <laughs> I didn't know that all it was doing was creating more experiences for me to pity myself over. But then I didn't know in those days. Remember, no matter where you are in life, no matter what you've contributed to creating, no matter what's happening, you're always doing the best you can with the understanding and awareness and knowledge that you have. And when you know more, you'll do it differently. So never ever please berate yourself for where you were or even where you are. You know, say to yourself, you're doing the best you can, but you know, we're in a pickle now and we want to get out of it, so let's find out what's the best way to do it. Because if all you do is tell yourself that you're stupid, then you stay stuck. You need loving support if you want to make changes. I started to watch some of what I said. And I became aware of my self-criticism and I tried to stop it. And I began to babble affirmations without quite knowing what they meant. And a few small changes began to take place. And I started to do it with the easy ones, of course. I got the green lights in the parking places. And boy, did I think I was hot stuff. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I thought I knew it all. And I, I very soon became very cocky and arrogant and dogmatic in my beliefs and feeling I knew all the answers. But it was my way of feeling safe in this new area that I was moving through. Because, you know, when you start to move away from some of your rigid old beliefs, especially if you've been into control forever in order to feel safe, it's very scary to move out and start trusting an affirmation. I mean, this is, you know, a thought that's going through your mind and you're trusting it to change your life. That's a very scary thing to do. So I was grasping onto things. 
And yet it was a beginning, it was a beginning for me, and I still had a long way to go. And like most of us, I didn't find the pathway always easy and smooth because just babbling affirmations didn't always work. And I couldn't understand why. What was I doing wrong? Immediately, right, you go for yourself, what am I doing wrong? Was this one more example of me not being good enough? My favorite old one. I remember my teacher at the time used to mention to me resentment. And I didn't have the faintest idea of what he was talking about. Me? I, surely I didn't have any resentments. I mean, after all, I was on the pathway. I was spiritually perfect. <laughs> How little I could see of myself then. <laughs> But I continued with my life, and I continued doing the best thing I could. And I studied metaphysics and spirituality and myself as much as I could. I grasped what I could, and sometimes I applied it. You know, we know a lot of things, or we grasp them, but we don't always practice. We don't always use them. And at that point, I'd been into it for two or three years. You know, time goes by very quickly. I was beginning to teach it. I had become a, a practitioner with Science of Mind. And I wondered now and then why my students seemed to be so stuck. Why were they so stuck in their problems? I gave them so much good advice. Why weren't they using it and getting well? <laughs> why weren't they living it? It never dawned on me that I was talking the truth more than I was living it. It was sort of like being a parent that tells you what to do and then does exactly the opposite or doesn't practice what they're talking about. And then one day, seemingly out of the blue, I was diagnosed, that's a very scary word we hear so much of these days, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I knew too much by then to hide from myself any longer. Uh, I knew that cancer was a disease of resentment that literally is held for a very long time till it eats away at the body. You see, when we stuff things down inside of us, it has to go somewhere. And if we spend a lifetime of stuffing things down, it's going to manifest at some point somewhere. And of course, I became very aware then what the resentment within me could be about. I had been a very badly physically and sexually abused child. And of course I'd have resentment. Of course I would be bitter and unforgiving. Why wouldn't I? I had never, ever done any work to change it or to release it or to let it go. When I left home, it was all I could do to just no, no longer think of that stuff and try to put it behind me. And when I found my spiritual pathway, I covered my feelings up or whatever was down there. I covered with a nice layer of spirituality. And I put such a wall around myself that I literally was totally out of touch with my own feelings. I didn't know who I was or where I was. But after my diagnosis, my inner work of beginning to get to know myself really began at that point. Thank God I had tools to work with. Because I know what the panic is when you're first diagnosed and you don't know what to do. But I had guidance and I had tools to work with and I knew that I needed to go within me if I was going to make any permanent changes. Yes, the doctor could give me an operation and perhaps take care of that for the moment. But if I didn't change what was going on inside of me, if I didn't change the way I was using my thoughts and my words, I'd probably recreate it again. So no longer was I content to get green lights in the parking places. I knew that I had to go much, much deeper. And I realized that I was not really progressing in my life the way I wanted to because I hadn't really cleared out this old garbage from childhood. And I wasn't living with what I was teaching. My inner child really needed help because my inner child was in great pain. And I needed to recognize that and work with her. But thank God I had these tools to work with and I knew what to do. And I began a, a program of self-healing in earnest. Uh, one of the first things I remember I did was to uh, l began studying and reading everything I could about alternative ways to heal cancer because I truly believed it could be done.
And yes, I did a nutritional cleansing program, which was very good for my body. I did affirmations, I did treatments, I did visualizations, I worked in every way that I could. And I also went to a good therapist who was skilled in helping people express and release their angers. And I spent a whole period of beating pillows and kicking and screaming, and it, it was wonderful. It felt so good because I'd never, ever, ever had permission to do that in my life. And we also worked on understanding and on forgiveness. You know, no matter what avenue of spirituality you follow, you will find always that forgiveness is an enormous issue at any time, but most particularly when there's an illness. Even the Course in Miracles says that all dis-ease comes from a state of non-forgiveness. And when we are ill, we need to look around and see who it is we need to forgive. And it's usually that very person that we think we will never forgive. But of course, not forgiving someone else doesn't harm them in the slightest, but it plays havoc with us. It plays havoc with us. Because the issues aren't theirs, the issues are ours. So one of the things I did was I explored my parents' childhood as much as I could. And I began to understand where they were coming from. And I realized that where they were coming from and how they'd been brought up, they couldn't really have done anything differently than what they did. They were brought up in abuse and they continued to abuse. And nobody taught them another way to go. It was their way of life. But my growing understanding enabled me to start the forgiveness process. You know, if you're walking down the street and somebody bumps into you and you whip around, you're very angry, how dare they do that? And then you see that the person is blind. The understanding that you have instantly dissolves that anger. And I think that when we can really begin to understand the childhood of the people who have done us wrong, it enables us to go almost beyond forgiveness and into understanding so that we can open the doors to our own heart. You see, people who have problems loving themselves are always people who are not willing to forgive because non-forgiveness shuts that door. And when you forgive and when you let go, not only does a huge weight drop over off your shoulders, but the doorway to your own self-love opens up. You know, people will say, oh, such a load has dropped off. Well, of course, because you've been carrying this burden forever. Now, I'm not saying that we're condoning poor behavior, because we're not. We don't want to be in bondage ourselves to something that perhaps happened a long, long time ago. As my forgiveness of them grew, so did my willingness to forgive myself. Forgiveness of ourselves is enormously important. See, many of us grow up and we begin hating our inner child for having had those experiences. And we do the same things to our inner child that they did to us. We just continue it. And that's very sad because when we were children and other people may have been mistreating us, we didn't have options. But when we grow up and we are mistreating our own inner child, that's very sad and very, very tragic. And as I forgave myself, I began to trust myself to take care of me. When we don't trust life or when we don't trust other people, it's really because we don't trust ourselves. We don't trust ourselves to take care of ourselves in a situation. So we say, I'll never fall in love again because I, won't, I don't want to get hurt or I will never let this happen. But what we're really saying is, I don't trust you enough to take good care of me. So I'm going to stay away from everything. But I began to trust myself enough to take care of me. And I found it easier and easier to love myself. And my body was healing. And most of all, my heart was healing. Most of all, my heart was healing.
You know, as Dr. Harrison says in that wonderful book, Love Your Disease, forgiveness of both the self and the parents, or dropping the past, which is what you're doing, cures more illness than antibiotics ever will. And he also says it takes a lot to stop children from loving their parents, but when they do, it takes even more for them to forgive. And therapy usually revolves around the willingness to forgive. When we won't forgive, when we won't let go, what we're really doing is binding ourselves to the past. And when you're stuck in the past, you cannot live in present time. And if you cannot live in present time, how are you going to create a glorious future? Because this stuff from the past just bounces over and creates more future stuff. Dr. Harrison with Love Your Disease and Bernie Siegel with Love Medicine and Miracles are both marvelous people and I quote them a lot because they're medical doctors who are into the spiritual way of looking at life and truly understand the connection of body, mind and spirit. And it's interesting, more and more physicians today are becoming open to the body-mind connection. Some of them are adding the body-mind-spirit connection. Not too many of them are vocal or will write books. But it, when they do, it's great because often people will not listen to a crazy lady like me. They think I'm just off the wall, <laughs> which is all right. But then I will recommend either Dr. Harrison or uh, Bernie Siegel because sometimes they'll listen to a medical doctor. I think it's wonderful the way... Things are opening up so much right now. This consciousness raising movement is going all over the planet in every area of life, every area. You know, I heard something the other day. Robert Schuller from the UN gave a talk in Hollywood at the Directors Guild. And one of the things that he said was that peace is breaking out all over the planet. You know, we, well, we hear of wars all the time. He said, peace is breaking out all over the planet. There are pockets of peace. And we are seeing more signs of peace all over than they ever have before. This is the head of the UN. And he also said that the human species needs to believe that peace is possible so that we can have it. See, our consciousness is so important. The power of our minds and the power of our words is vitally important. And we can contribute to the demise of the planet or we can contribute to the healing of the planet. And we seem to be in extraordinary camps at the moment. I mean, there's a lot of violence going, a lot of, a lot of drug abuse, a lot of chaos, a lot of unemployment and poverty, and yet there's this incredible expanding of consciousness where people, many, many, many hundreds of thousands of people all over the planet are learning that they have the power to change their lives and they're learning about what their minds can do and it's wonderful. Somebody came up to me and was speaking to me just this evening about translating my book into Lebanese. You know, it's wonderful. Things are happening everywhere. We think, oh, it's just happening here or it's just happening in the church. It's not true. It's going all over the place. Therapy revolves around the willingness to forgive. The willingness to stop giving my power to them back there and accepting my own power in the here and now. Making my word important rather than their word. I'm the only person that can think in my mind, just like you're the only person that can think in your mind. And nobody can force us to think in a different way. We choose our thoughts, and these are the basis for our self-talk. But anyway, I gradually lived more of what I was teaching, and I really watched my words and my thoughts. And I constantly forgave myself for not being perfect. I allowed myself to be, rather than struggling to be super person so I could be acceptable for one day. And I began for the first time to trust life and to see it as a, a, a friendly place. And I remember I lightened up and my humor became less biting and funnier. 
and I worked on releasing criticism and judgment of myself and of other people. And I stopped telling disaster stories. <laughs> I guess no one else here has ever done that. You know, we're so quick to sp spread the bad news. It's just amazing. And I stopped reading the newspaper, and I stopped listening to the news, and I gave up the 11 o'clock news at night. I said, I will not take that into my dream state with me. And then I did a biggie. I decided to stop gossiping. <laughs> and I found I had nothing to say to anyone for three weeks. <laughs> Until I learned there were other ways of talking. <laughs> It wasn't an easy habit to break, but if I would be gossiping about other people, then people would be gossiping about me, wouldn't they? Remember, what we give out, we get back. Now, I also discovered mirror work, and I did daily sessions in front of the mirror. And the most difficult, of course, was to say to myself, I love you, I really love you. It took a lot of tears and a lot of breathing to get through that one. But when I did, it was like a jump had taken place. But most of all, I was really consistent with what I did. I practiced all my waking hours. You know, there are many, many people who will say a prayer in the morning or do an affirmation or treatment or meditate, and then they leave the house and jump in the car and start screaming at people. <laughs> Five or ten minutes or twenty minutes in the morning is wonderful. And you get better results if you can be consistent all day long. I thanked myself before I went to sleep. I thanked myself for what I had done during the day and knowing that I had done the best I could. And I affirmed that the healing process was taking place in my body while I slept and that I'd awaken in the morning bright and refreshed and feeling good. And in the morning I'd awaken and I'd thank everything I could think of, including myself and my body. And I'd know and affirm that this day would be a joy and a delight and that I was willing to learn and to grow and to change. And I learned also that I could make changes without seeing myself as a bad person. See, too many of us, we have to be wrong or bad in order to make a change. That's why we criticize ourselves so much. We think it's going to make a change, but it doesn't. When we can come from loving acceptance then the changes come much easier. And we make a change because we want to improve the quality of our life, not because we're a bad person who has to be better. And it's a different way of looking at it. And when the doctor said I no longer had cancer in my body, I knew I'd made deep internal changes. Now, I did not have an operation. I did not have chemo and I did not have radiation. I don't tell other people to do that because I know very well that, the, that God works through the medical profession also. And sometimes an operation is a necessary thing to have while we change our consciousness. But I decided to use the tools that I knew and to really go for it. And I was pleased with the remission, but I wasn't surprised. You know, as Dr. Bernie Siegel says in Love, Medicine, and Miracles, when people change the new personality often does not need the old disease. The new personality does not need the old disease. And a bonus that I hadn't expected was that I got to look younger. And I thought, oh, isn't that fun? <laughs> and the clients I now attracted were almost all people who were willing to work on themselves. They made enormous progress. And without me really saying anything, they could sense and feel that I was living what I was teaching. So it was easier for them to accept the ideas I was teaching and work with them. And of course they got positive results. You can't do inner work on yourself without improving the quality of our life. And that's what it's all about, really. We improve the quality of our life. We make peace with ourselves on an inner level. And we learn to love and accept who we are. And then life seems to flow much, much nicer. 
So what did this experience teach me personally? That I really had the power to change my life if I was willing to change my thinking. And as I worked with people, I really began to listen to what they said. I really began to hear the words, not just get the general drift. And after 10 minutes with a new client, I could tell exactly why they had a problem. Because I could hear the words they were speaking, I could see how they were talking, and I knew that was contributing to their problem. And if they were talking and thinking that way, what was their self-talk like? It must be more and more of the same negative programming. Poverty thinking, as I call it. And I really understood the saying that the subconscious mind has no sense of humor. <laughs> this is important for us to know because you cannot make a joke about yourself uh, and just think, oh, well, it doesn't mean anything. If it's a put-down joke, your subconscious mind accepts it as true. Your subconscious mind or the universe, whatever, however you want to call it, accepts everything you say as truth for you. And it creates according to your beliefs. It's like God always says yes. We have been given this infinite power of choice and the universe backs up everything. And if you want to believe that you're a failure and nobody loves you and that you'll never amount to anything and life is difficult and you'll never have what you want, the universe loves you enough to give you what you declare. You have unlimited choice and if you choose these poverty concepts and beliefs, then it's assumed that that's what you want and that's what you'll get and will continue to get until you're willing to change your thoughts and make other choices. We're never stuck because we can always think another thought. Billions and billions of thoughts to choose from. I remember when I used to work with clients privately, I would hear them arguing so much for their limitations they would always want me to know that they were stuck because of this or this or this or whatever. But you know, if we believe that we're stuck, if we accept that we're stuck, then we are stuck. We get to be stuck because our belief is being fulfilled. You could notice with other people what they say and how they say it. And see if you can begin to connect what they say with what they're experiencing in their life. You know, many, many people live their lives in shoulds. Should is a word that my ear is very attuned to. It bounces, it's almost like a bell goes off every time I hear it. And often I will hear people that will use 12 shoulds in a paragraph. And then they wonder why their life is so rigid, why they can't move, why they don't live in a life of freedom. But they're into a lot of control and they're either making themselves wrong or someone else. And you know, the way we say things and how they, we say them can be as simple as getting up in the morning and looking outside and seeing the rain and saying, it's a lousy day or it's a wet day. It's totally different approach and yet the rain is still there. The rain isn't going to make it any different. It's how you approach it. So notice how happy, joyous people usually have very nice lives. And notice how lonely, unhappy, poor, ill people often talk. How do they have a tendency to talk? What words do they use? And what have they accepted as the truth for themselves? How do they describe themselves? How do they describe their work, their lives, their relationships? What do they look forward to? What have they accepted as truth for them? And please don't run around telling perfect strangers that they're ruining their lives. <laughs> and don't do it with your friends or family either because it's not going to be appreciated. <laughs> but use this information to begin to make connections that you can apply to yourself. Because it's your life you want to change. Are you willing to change your life by changing your thinking? Because even on the smallest level, if you change your thinking and the way you talk, your experiences are going to change. Are you willing to change your self-talk into positive affirmations? 
Now remember, an affirmation is really anything we say or think. A lot of what we normally say and think is quite negative and it doesn't create good experiences for ourselves. We have to retrain our thinking and speaking into positive patterns if we're going to get good results. When we talk about doing affirmations, we really mean to make a positive statement about something we want to eliminate from our life or something we want to create in our lives. And too often we say things like, I don't want this in my life anymore. But that doesn't give us a clear picture. We don't state clearly what we do want. You know, to say, I, I don't want to be sick anymore doesn't give your subconscious mind a clear picture of the health you'd really like. You've got to realize that your spoken word is very, very powerful. If you say, I hate this job, it doesn't give you a wonderful new job. Even if you get a new job, you'll probably hate it soon because that's what you're saying about it. So you need to clearly declare your desires in a very positive way. Think for a moment, what is it you really want right now? What is it you want today in your life? And then say to yourself, I accept for myself whatever that is. Now, do you really believe you really deserve to have it? Or what thoughts inside of you would you have to change in order to deserve it? If you really believe on some level that you're not good enough, or that life never works for you, or everybody else gets but not you, then you're not going to be able to get what you want. See, what would be the first thought that you would need to think to begin to create this new thing? What would be the building block, the foundation that you would stand on? What would be the sort of thing you would need to know for yourself, to believe, to accept? Well, a good one would be, I love myself, I am worthy, I deserve, I am allowed to be fulfilled. Things that are positive, things that you can believe at the very basis of what you're saying. So that you can build on that. And then do your affirmations on top of that to create what you want. So if you really believe that your thoughts create your world, you're going to be very careful what you think and what you say. And you're going to shape your thoughts to create what you want. And remember also, though, that when you first say an affirmation, it may not seem to be true. Because remember, affirmations are like planting seeds in the ground. And when you plant a seed in the ground, that's what you have. You don't have a full-grown plant. You have a little seed that has to germinate, which means it breaks its shell. And then the first little roots go down into the soil and get some nourishment. And only at that point does that first little shoot come up. And it's the same thing with affirmations. It takes some time, you know, to go from a seed to a full-grown plant. And it takes some time from that first declaration to the final demonstration. We need to be patient with the growing season. I like to think sometimes of doing treatment work or affirmations. It's like going to the cosmic kitchen. You know, if you go to a restaurant and the waiter or waitress comes and takes your order and they go into the kitchen and you don't run in with them to see how it's going to be prepared and when it's going to be prepared and how fast it's going to be out. You sit and you do what you do. You either have a drink or a cup of coffee or you drink your water or your tea or you talk to your friend or you eat your rolls and butter and you assume that that's going to come out. Well, I think it's the same thing once we begin to do affirmations or treatment work. We put it into what I like to think of as the cosmic kitchen, and the great chef is working on it. <laughs> so you go on with your life, and you know that it's being taken care of. And if the issue comes up in your mind, you can say, that's being taken care of. It's on order. It's happening. <laughs> now, you know, if... If you're in a restaurant and they bring the wrong order out, or it's not what you ordered, and you have self-esteem, you'll send it back. 
If not, you'll eat it. You also have a right to do that with the cosmic kitchen. If you don't get exactly what you wanted, then say, no, that's not quite it. This is what I want. But perhaps you weren't clear in your ordering. <laughs> What if you've been on the pathway and doing the work for some time? Does that mean you have nothing else to learn? Are you really going to sit on your laurels and just rest? Or do you realize that this inner work is a lifetime occupation? And that once you start it, you really never stop. Or oh, you can hit plateaus and you can take vacations. But basically, it's a lifetime work. So you want to look at your life, really. Check it out. What works and what doesn't work? You know, are all departments in your life the way you want them? Are you healthy? Are you happy? Are you prosperous? Are you creatively fulfilled? Do you feel safe? Do you feel secure? What areas do you need to work on? Is there more work to do? How do you need to change your thinking in certain areas? See, are you really aware of what you're currently saying and how you're saying it? A lot of us aren't too aware of that. And I find an exercise that works very well is to put a tape recorder by your telephone. And every time you make a call or every time you get a call, you push that record button. And after the tape is full on both sides, then you sit down and listen to it. And you will get a great idea. It will be very clear to you of what you say and how you're saying it. You know, it's said that we only use 10% of our brain. Well, I think we really use even less of our spiritual powers. The potential within us is enormous, and we scarcely tap it. I think we really are all healers. I think this is something that we have within us, but we have to know it. We have to know it. So how are you using your spiritual powers? Are you using them for your benefit? Are you choosing your thoughts and your words with care and precision? Do you meditate? See, meditate to me is being quiet long enough to go within to hear the wisdom that's within you. I don't have answers for you. I can give some guidelines. But in each and every one of you is all the wisdom and all the answers to all the questions you'll ever ask. But you've got to trust yourself enough and quiet down enough to go inside. My form of meditation is to sit down and close my eyes and say, what is it I need to know? And then just sit there and see what comes up. Because I know whatever I need to know is going to be revealed to me. Do you visualize the things that you want? If you want something, do you see it clearly in your mind? Do you visualize world peace? Do you make declarations? Do you do affirmations? Do you do treatment work to create for yourself what you want? Or do you just hope it'll happen? See, hoping really means that we don't believe it's going to happen at all. See, only you can clear out your own pain. Nobody can do that for you but yourself. There's so much more to our life. There's so much more to your life than perhaps you're accepting or that you're aware of. We are powerful human beings. We are very powerful. And we need to accept our own power. As we enlarge our awareness, as we begin to understand more, we also expand our horizons. And our whole world opens up. We're at a point in time where we need to have a much more cosmic view of life. You can let your world become all that it can be. Let's learn to accept the power of our minds and the power of our words and our thoughts because the future is up to us. And what kind of future do you want? Have you thought about the future that you really want for yourself? And what kind of future do you want for society? What sort of society or community do you want to live in? And what are you doing to contribute to that? What are you doing for the planet? Our minds are powerful, very powerful. 
and it's up to us to save the world if we want to. If we want to be responsible for our lives, remember, we've got to be responsible for our mouths. It's very important. Our words are powerful, our thoughts create our reality, and so let's choose them with wisdom. Let's create a series of beliefs that really work for us. You know, with all the power of the universe backing our words and thoughts, let's declare and accept for ourselves that we are always safe. Wherever we go, that we're safe. Let's make these personal truths for us. I've been believing this for a long time, that everything we need to know is revealed to us. And everything we need comes to us in the perfect time-space sequence. Let's know that life is a joy and filled with love. And let's know that we are loving and lovable and loved. And let's know for ourselves that we're healthy and filled with energy. And that we prosper wherever we turn. And that we're willing to change and to grow. And that all is well in our world. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you.